Hey, good morning, gasaholics. I'm Hot Rod Bob, and you've got gas, the morning edition. Hey, we're back. It's Thursday. I'm getting ready to go to the track, and we're going to give you a little bit of gas on the way. Now, a lot of people like muscle cars. I like them, too. I can't afford one, but I like muscle cars. And when it comes down to, well, I want the image of the muscle car, or I want to drive a muscle car, maybe not as a daily driver. They tend to be a little bit fuelish. But you can build a car that resembles a very expensive muscle car for a lot less than what you might think and what a real muscle car would cost. And when I say a real muscle car, I'm talking about GTOs, G GTO judges, SS396s, SS454s, the Roadrunners, the Dodge Chargers, the cars we know as iconic machines that are muscle cars, true muscle cars. Now, someone tells you a Mustang's a muscle car. They didn't grow up when the Mustangs were really first introduced and popular. Those were pony cars. Now, I'm going to give you a few of those into this mix only because they're popular. But when we talk about Dodge and muscle cars, today they think about Dodge Chargers today. The four doors. It's a mommy machine. All right, it's fast. You got supercharged Hemi's as options. But can you plunk down fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars for a new car? I sure can't. Can you put down seventy thousand dollars on a nice vintage Hemi powered Dodge Charger? No, I sure can't. But there are alternatives. And let's start out with an alternative to a Mustang. Now, yeah, you're talking Camaros. They're expensive. Firebirds, they're going up in value. But what has stayed pretty constant and is relatively inexpensive when you find them is Ford Mustang's counterpart, its kissing cousin, the Mercury Cougar. Now, the Cougar was a more luxurious version of the Mustang. It sat on the same basic platform, but it was a little bit longer, giving a better ride. There was nothing visually shared with the Mustang, which makes it quite unique. It was more of a luxurious vehicle, but it had the same engine options. And in many cases, they were probably more percentage-wise outfitted with big blocks than the equivalent Mustang. Now, the first Cougars came out in 1967. Mercury was behind the eight ball. It took them a while to catch up with their Ford division. And they came out about the same time the Camaro and the Firebird came out. But they are less expensive. Why? Well, they didn't have a performance image like the Mustang did. So if you're into a pony car and you want something that's still relatively affordable, seek out the Cougar. The XR7 with the big block, dynamite. The Eliminator 351. 429 Cobra Jets, they had them all in the Cougar. So look for a Cougar. They started out in 1967, hideaway headlights, clean, smooth lines. lines. They rode better. Again, they had a longer wheelbase. Good morning, Don. Hi, Scott. How are you? And Yvonne. But they are cool cars. I think they drive a whole lot better. And Dan Gurney used them in the Trans Am series. They were quite effective and they were winners back then. Now, they only produced about 27,000 of the XR7 model, which was their performance image vehicle, but only 2,600 of them came with the GT package that made them even more fun. Hi, Rebecca, how are you? So, but under $20,000, you've got yourself a nice pony car. Pony car, remember guys? Long hood, short deck, pony car based on the popularity of the Mustang. Not a muscle car. I don't care what engine's in it. It's a pony car. All right, the next car on the list. Now, these weren't necessarily considered muscle cars, but with the L79 option, the Nova became a hot rod. 350 horsepower, 327. What's the difference between a L79 and a 283 Nova? The engine size. There's nothing externally other than a badge that indicates it's a more muscular vehicle. And 327s, well, they're hard to find. They're two-bolt main. 
they put out some good horsepower. They're high revers, but a 350 crate motor put into a 1962 to 1965 first gen Nova. Maybe you got yourself a nice muscular compact car and parts are available from various manufacturers for them. You can really build these things up and have fun. Novas are probably as popular as the Tri-5 Chevys were to my generation. Although a lot of guys have these first-gen Novas. Now, there's two variations of the first-gen Nova. The first body style, coming out in 1962, stayed in production through 1965. Although on the same chassis, it was different. The different body style for the 66 and 67 Novas. Those are first-gen Novas, mechanically identical. The base engine of those Novas was a 153-cubic-inch four-cylinder engine. Try and find one of those. Mm, tough, but can be done. Good morning, Juan Reyes. How are you doing? I hope you're working and having fun. Good morning, Craig. Craig Heidenthal, Service Tech Equipment, one of the people that helps bring gas to you each and every day. All right, so the Chevrolet Nova is an opportunity for you, and they were produced for many, many years. The more expensive ones are the second gen. From 1970 on, or 1968 on, those get real expensive, but they can still be found. It's still an alternative. Yenko stripes are available. You can slap those on. Big blocks fit in there. No problem. Make your own muscle car. The look is the same. Are you worried about driving a clone that looks like what a muscle car of the day did? I'm not. I'm not going to profess it's the real thing either, but I can enjoy it. All right, the next car on the list, the Ford Falcon. Now, that was the counterpart to Chevy's Nova, and actually, it came out long before the Nova did. The Falcon was introduced in 1959. Did not get a V8 till 1963, although the Nova didn't get one until 64. Considered a muscle car? Well, not really. Muscular? Yeah. The 260 was first available beginning in 1963. In 64, then in 65, the 289 came out. A multitude of engines will fit in there. A nice 347 stroker motor, 302 with injection, makes these little Falcons real muscular. It's a compact car, and someone may call it a muscle car if it's got the horsepower, but in reality, it's still a compact car with muscular features. Shelby raced the Falcon before he got the Mustangs. Check it out. They ran in Trans Am and in Europe, in the Milia Milia. So the Falcon Sprint is the high dollar one, but what's the difference between a Falcon Sprint and a standard Falcon? Trim pieces. Will the V8s fit? You betcha. Are there a multitude of suspensions available for these cars to upgrade them? Oh yeah, everything that fits a Mustang will fit the Falcon. And you can have fun with the Falcon, just like a Mustang, and it's a lot cheaper than a Mustang. And there's a strong club, national club, that you can join. I started the SoCal division many years ago with my wife Peg. It's out there. Have some fun. It's an inexpensive way to get into the muscular hobby. Now, you see, you've always had your heart set on a GTO, but you really can't afford those GTO $50,000 price tags they've got out there now. Well, one of the ways to do it is the Pontiac Tempest. What's the difference between a Tempest and a GTO? Some trim pieces, maybe the tail light, the front bumper on some of the later ones. But the Pontiac Tempest will take all of the upgrades that you can put on a GTO. From the outside, it's a GTO. Don't put the badges on it. You're faking it. You're calling it a clone. But can you upgrade a Tempest or a Le Mans to be as muscular as a GTO? Oh, hell yeah. And you can do it for a lot less than the cost of a GTO itself. So, the Tempest Le Mans. Now, the Tempest first came out as a compact car when Generous Motors introduced their first compact lines back in the early 1960s. In 1964, though, Generous Motors decided to move them up and take away the compacts from Oldsmobile, Buick, and Pontiac. They made them mid-sized cars, using the same basic platform that the 64 Chevelle was on. Chevy got to keep the Nova and the Corvair. They had two compact cars. The other divisions didn't keep them. When the first Pontiac Tempest came out in 1961, it had a Corvair-style rear transaxle. It still had the engine up front. The first Tempests were powered by a four-cylinder, basically a half a 389 engine. 
powerful, mm, 160 horsepower on the four barrel version. Base engine was 120 or 130 horsepower, but the 326 V8 was an option. And then they moved up scale. And in 1964, it became a mid-sized car. The difference between a 64 Tempest and a 64 GTO, taillights, some trim pieces, the inset in the dashboard, the hood, and a 389 engine. If you look at the VIN number, it doesn't tell you it's a GTO. It will say it's a Le Mans GTO because the GTO was a trim option and engine option, not a separate model in 1964. So could you upgrade a Tempest all the way through the 70s into a GTO status? Sure, it's easy. And a multitude of engines will fit under that en engine compartment or in the engine compartment. So the Pontiac Le Mans, Pontiac Tempest, a great way to get a muscular-looking car that gives you the image of the GTOs. Now, Dodge Chargers is, was put on this list for some reason. I'm not quite sure why. They're really unaffordable. Uh, you can find the later ones, the smogged-out ones, two doors I'm talking about. To me, the four-door Charger's a nice car. It's just not a Charger to me. All Chargers to me were two doors. The first one, the 66, 67s, are my favorite. Those are the long, fastback roof Dodge Chargers with the hideaway headlights built on the same chassis as the Coronet. Now, I like those cars, especially the 66 with its four bucket seats. But those are made of unattainium. There weren't that many made to start with, and they're very expensive if you can find one. The later model, big bumper cars, the two doors, they got heavy, they got a little rounded you can find them are they a bad buy no not in this market if you can get one and get one good go for it again the multitude of mopar motors that can be swapped in there you can have yourself one heck of a nice muscle car and a lot of the performance trim options are available in reproduction for you here's another car made by generous motors that uh, had a performance image but also had a vehicle that was not the performance model, but trim pieces are the things that separated it. The Oldsmobile Cutlass. Now, I talked about it being a compact car to start with. As a matter of fact, my mother had a 1963 Cutlass that was the tiny one. I kind of liked it. Had the aluminum V8 engine, not a powerhouse, 215 horsepower, but hey, it was cool. In 1964, it jumped midsize as well, and the 442 was first introduced. Now, the original 442 was four-barrel, four-speed, dual exhaust. Or was it four-speed, four-barrel, dual exhaust? It was 330 cubic inches. Now, remember, the GTO had 389. The Oldsmobile missed the mark with their 330 cubic inch engine because they didn't think about putting the 394 out of the big holes into the cutlass body. Same basic block. It fit. People at Oldsmobile, a little too stodgy. They caught on the following year, and the 442 became a 400 cubic inch engine when all the divisions complained to GM corporate that, well, Pontiac did it. Why can't we? So they did. But the cutlass exterior, the body, it's the same as the other performance Oldsmobile 442s. Don, Don Kood saying DeLorean responsible for for waking out the GTO. Yes, he was. He was the lead guy at the Pontiac division that brought out the GTO. Did some testing on Woodward Boulevard, I'm told. But the Oldsmobile Cutlass, you can make it as powerful and stylish as a 442. Remember, it's only some trim pieces. Then there was the W30 model of the Oldsmobile Cutlass, the performance version of the non-442s. Cool cars, 350s. You can make one of those. Hearst Oldsmobile, yeah, those were cool, too. The striping, still available. You can make it. Hi, Jerry Littner. How are you doing this morning? So the Oldsmobile Cutlass is a fine example of a car you can get into. 442s, some of them are climbing as high as seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 if you get the right option package. But the Cutlass, unnoticed. The Barracudas, 64, 65, or 66 are my favorite. The 67... 68, not so much, but they're still out there, and they're still relatively affordable. 
Now, with the stock 273s they came with, not real powerful at 235 horsepower in the four-barrel version, they weren't real powerhouses. Now, the Mustang started the pony car craze, but it wasn't the first pony car to come out. The Barracuda actually beat the Mustang to market by two weeks. The problem was nobody noticed, because Ford had blanketed the airwaves and the magazines with advertising promoting the new Mustang. So the Barracuda kind of went unnoticed, even though it came out first. And it's still a popular car, and affordable. First-gen Barracudas. Now, when you get to the 1970, which was the more typical pony car style, with the short deck and the long front hood, they start to climb in price and value. And some of those are going for six figures. Can you get one cheap? Yeah, you can probably find a six-cylinder one, but you can upgrade that to the V8 status. It's not that tough. The earlier ones, go for it. Do what you want. The second-gen Barracudas were available with big blocks. The first gens were not. So you know you can get the big block in there if that's what you're looking for. And I'll tell you what. A Barracuda, there was really very little trim difference between a performance Barracuda and a base Barracuda. Now, a lot of people call them Cudas. Understand, Cuda was a slang for Barracuda, but Chrysler picked it up and started using it in 1970 on their performance versions of the Barracuda. If it says Barracuda across the tail, it's not the performance model. If it says Cuda, in chrome strip or script, that is the factory performance Barracudas. Can they be found? Yes. Tough, but you can do it. Externally, no difference. Stripes, you can add those easily. Here's a car that I really like, and it's often overlooked, and that is the Ford Fairlanes 1968, or Torinos as they call them at that point in time. I love the fastback design. It is great. You can get those with six cylinders, 302s, all the way up to the 429 Cobra Jets. Are they cool looking? You bet. Can you modify them and make them look cool? You know you can. Are they available inexpensively? Yeah, but you got to search for them. And that is the issue, searching for them. They weren't all that popular when new, so finding one now is going to take some effort. But a good 68 Fastback, I really like those, and they are cool. 390s, 428s, you got it. Now, there's a later model, the Torino, which became more angular, and that was more popular. Those are still available. You can still find them as well, and there's a unique feature of that year, of 1970 Torinos. Did you know the 1970 Falcon was basically a Torino with a different roof line? And it was available with the Cobra Jet motor. Yeah. Real performance out of a Ford Falcon. We talked about the Ford Falcon Sprint's first generation cars, second generation Falcons. They're cool, still on the Mustang platform. But in 1970, the Falcon became the base model of the Torino line. With kind of a rounded roof instead of the more fastback roof, but with the big engine option. And you'll see a, a few of those at the drags. They're very hard to find. There was the counterpart to the Barracuda, the Dodge Challenger. and a little bit longer wheelbase, less of them made, and performance options, yeah, same as the Barracuda. Performance image, about the same as the Barracuda. Price, a little bit higher for some reason, probably because of the lower production numbers. So 73, 74 Dodge Challengers, yeah, you can find one, you like them, go for it. They're big and they're heavy for their group. And again, they are pony cars. Even with the big engine, it's still a pony car, guys. Short deck lid, long hood. That's the style of them. Another car that may not be considered a muscle car by many, but was available with up to 421 cubic inches, was the, the Pontiac Grand Prix. Now, some of those are really jumping up in value, but you can get them. And Jerry Littner's even talking about the Barracuda still. He had a Barracuda Formula S for his first car. Lucky guy. But the Pontiac Grand Prix, a luxurious, full-size, personal luxury car. Now, equate the Pontiac Grand Prix to the Chevrolet Monte Carlo. Big, comfortable, heavy, and 
filled with performance motors as options, although the base motor in the, in the Grand Prix was a 389. Later on, they went all the way up to 455 cubic inches. They're fun, they're big, they're comfortable, and they were made for a number of years, and because of that, the early ones, though, are climbing in value rapidly. The later model ones, you can get those relatively inexpensive, and you can make a Grand Prix or a Bonneville, which is the same basic body style later on in life, look like the 2 plus 2 Pontiac that a car and driver, they said it was one of the quickest cars they had ever driven. Big, bad, and powerful. So the full-size Pontiacs. Now, Dusters and Dodge Demons, Dodge Start Swingers, Dodge Darts, same body style. Plymouth Valiants, same body style in the second generation or third generation series. Going up in value. Just looked at one for a friend. Fully redone. Upgraded to 340 status, 4-speed, disc brakes, air conditioning, bright, sublime green paint job, and the right stripes. How about $20,000? $25,000 if you pay what he's asking. Good muscle car? Yeah. Inexpensive? Compared to many? Yes. Affordable? You betcha. Fun? Oh, yeah. Go to a Mopar meet. Watch the people gather around you if you got a good, clean one. And Dodge Demon, everyone thinks about the Challenger today as the Dodge Demon. The first Dodge Demons came out, and they were based on this, the Dodge Dart Fastback, which was the Plymouth Duster. Plymouth was called the Duster in the Highline version. The Dodge was called the Demon. Chrysler got so much hate mail because they used the word Demon, they stopped producing that name after two years and started calling it the Dodge Swinger and returned it to Dodge Dart. As a matter of fact, Wendy Campbell, one of the ladies I know in the Mopar Club, we interviewed her just a while back. The show just aired again a couple of days ago in her passionate pink Dodge Dart. Not a duster. It's a Dodge Dart, and it's a cool car. Her husband just finished restoring a Barracuda, I believe it is, and that thing is gorgeous. So the Dodge Dart, a good option. Now remember, the original Dodge Darts were not compact cars. They were the base model full-size car with performance option. It wasn't until 1963 that Dodge changed the name of their compact car from Lancer to Dart. And then the Dart took off. It was now the full counterpart to the Valiant. And the Valiant is another choice over the Dodge Dart. Same car, same body pieces, different trim, mechanically identical. The Buick Skylark comes in. Now, again, I talk about the midsize GM cars. The Buick Skylark, the GS version, was the performance car. Finding one of those might be a little tough, but a regular Skylark, they're out there. As a matter of fact, Pure Vision, Steve, just completed his own personal Buick Skylark. And it's a cool car. Big engines? Well, the base engine was a six-cylinder, the V6. But they also had V8s. It'll fit. 455, 400 cubic inches, motor bolts in. Little motor bound change, you got yourself a performance vehicle. Suspension, same as the Malibu. So the upgrades you knew, you want to do to the, this car, easily done using the same aftermarket parts, disc brakes, and so forth, that are made for the Malibu. It sits on the same platform. Buick Skylark, another alternative to a muscle car. Now the GS, they're tough to find and they're expensive. But the regular Skylarks can made... He made to look just like the Grand Sport and just as much fun. Remember, it's the image and it's the fun. Now, muscle cars are not Mustangs. I don't care what engine you put in it. It may be a muscular Mustang. It's still a pony car. The Fox Body Mustangs beginning in 1979 are affordable and highly upgradable. Check it out. I mean, I can talk about the Mustang all day. But check out those Mustangs, 79 and later, the Fox body cars, it's a misnomer, it's actually the chassis design, was the engineering code Fox, but there is a car you can do. <laughs> Candy Larson's talking about the Pontiac Arcadian, considered a muscle car, well in Canada, yeah, kind of, but it depends on which Arcadian you're looking at. Some of the Arcadians were based on the Nova, and I've seen an Arcadian that was based on a Chevelle. But they were Pontiacs, different trim. 
All right, let's get away from the Camaros and the Mustangs. Those are our pony cars, Firebirds, pony cars. But let's go into something else, the Monte Carlo. Now, here is a personal luxury vehicle that Chevrolet came out with, and they were available, you know, six cylinders at first. 400 cubic inch small blocks and then 454 cubic inch big blocks and 400 inch 402 cubic inch big blocks as well. Along the lines of a Grand Prix, full-size car sits on the Chevelle chassis, but with a real long snout. The fenders are long, the hood is long. You lift the hood, I want to, and the hood is huge. You lift the hood, the engine is set back about two feet from the front grille. Cool car. Modifiable? You bet. Fun? Yeah. All the way up to their last Monte Carlos, and I actually like the aero back that they had, the aero coupes. That would be one on my list to get. So the Monte Carlo was produced for a number of years. Started out in 1970, and it was cool. They had the SS454 package. Yeah, those were cool cars. All right, we talked about the Duster and the Demon. Those are cool. Again, Kiss and Cousin cars. Very little difference externally from them. I, I talked about the Mustang. I'm going to drop the Mustang, but the Capri, the American Capri, was a Mustang with fender flares, and it's available less expensively than the Mustang. Comets. Now, the Comet was the kissing cousin to the Ford Falcon, and it was the same car until 1969. And in 1969, the Comet became the kissing cousin to the Maverick, the Ford Maverick. Now, Mavericks are going crazy value-wise. I had one. As a matter of fact, I just posted it on my page. And I can't afford to buy one of those anymore. But the Mercury version, not as popular. Exactly the same car, except for the hood and the grill and the bumper. Engine. Uh oh, someone's trying to. Was the decline that? So anyway, the Mercury Comet started out as the kissing cousin of the Falcon. Later on, became a variation of the Maverick. I like the taillights better. That's about it. It's the same car. You really want a Maverick, but you can only afford a Comet. Change the hood and the grill. You got it. Chevelles, well, they're climbing. They're difficult to find inexpensively. But a non-SS, what's the difference? Trim pieces? Yeah, the VIN number's going to tell you it's not an SS. Okay. Malibus. Chevelles. Chevelle Model 300 sedans. Lighter weight. Sedan model, not a hardtop. Cool. They're going up in value as well. All Chevelles, 1964 on. The last Chevelles, built in the 80s. They're cool. They're interesting cars. Here's a car that's considered somewhat of a muscle car and can be found cheap. The Shelby GLH. Goes like hell. Front-wheel drive, turbocharged, Mitsubishi-powered, compact Mopar. They're ripping off excellent times at the drag strip and still get you 30 miles per gallon. All right, I've taken up enough of your time. Mopars, muscle cars, Oldsmobiles, Buicks, look for something different. If it's a GTO, there's a compact or a less expensive variation of it, the Tempest. The Skylark versus the Grand Sport. The Cutlass versus the 442. The Falcon versus a Mustang. The Fairlane and early Torinos. Look at them. Muscle cars, cars they're having fun with. I'm Hot Rod Bob. You've got gas. Presented by Service Tech Equipment and Craig Heidenthal. You guys have a great day. I'm off to Irwindale Drag Strip. Going to have some fun. Hope you do too today. You take care. Bye.